2014-2015 season. I have the immense pleasure to introduce uh, my good friend Ria. She is a fifth year PhD student here in the biology department working on wildlife and disease. She's taken a study system of primates in southern Uganda uh, to look at what shapes parasite host interactions in wild communities, how sublethal infection might be influencing behavior of individuals, and extending her work to the human wildlife interaction and specifically targeting uh, zoonotic disease transmission in a conservation context. Um, in addition to publishing multiple journal articles and peer reviewed book chapters, she's an avid science communicator and has contributed to many blogs, including the Jane Goodall Institute's Think Globally, Lack, Act Locally. Um, and she's also passionate about pedagogy and is a proponent of active learning strategies, which she has been disseminating through her work with T Pulse as a uh, teaching assistant and also as an undergraduate course lecturer here at Google. She also has two black belts, is a champion ball hockey player, and wins the pie making competition on Pi Day department every year. Uh, her interest in behavior has brought her to study fish, marine mammals, dogs, human primates, non human primates, and in the next phase of her research, she is going to be doing work in uh, the Samburu ecosy Samburu -like ecosystem in central Kenya and switching to ungulates, both wild and domestic, looking at uh, the potential cross-species transmission of a newly discovered uh, blood-borne parasite. She's going to be doing her postdoc at UGA with uh, Vanessa Zenwa and joining an incredible team of disease ecologists there, and I'm sure she will be very welcome. Please join me in welcoming Ria Guy. better not suck because he was doing a really good intro. <laughs> <laughs> it better not. <laughs> um, okay, so for those of you who know me, it's probably no surprise that I'm going to be talking about parasites today. That's been the focus of my interest for the last six years as my PhD hopefully drags to a close. <laughs> um, and I guess the best place for me to start is at the beginning with why I like parasites in the first place. For me, that was always just a really easy question. I think parasites are just really cool. So, this is one example. This is Leucochloridium paradoxum. It's a parasite of snails, obviously. And the actual parasite structure that you're seeing in that picture is the green and brown bands that are extending into the eye stalk of the snail. And what they do is they pulsate when they get into the eye stalks. Um, stalks. And this creates a really psychedelic effect. And on top of that, this parasite actually changes the behavior of its host, such that the snail becomes active during the day and it starts seeking high ground. And so those two things combined makes the snail absolutely irresistible for birds, which then eat it, which is exactly what the parasite wants, because birds are its definitive host. So, I think this is just a really cool example, and I bet you'll all agree that this is a cool example of what parasites can do, but for me, when I first got started, stuff like this was just mind-boggling, um, that some, such a small creature can so completely control the life history of its host. And recently, um, I guess I'm not the only one who thinks parasites are cool, so a quick Google search these days will reveal all sorts of popular news articles about the disgusting and horrifying things that parasites can do to us and um, our fellow animals on this planet. All worth a read, definitely after lunch. <laughs> and parasites have also gained a lot more interest recently in research. So, especially in ecology, parasites are starting to get incorporated into a lot of different places. So for example, Kyoko and the Hendry group took parasites, added them to the guppy predator equation, and that's being done in all sorts of different places. So parasites are even getting added to food webs these days, and really cool results with those too. So in terms of ecological interest, parasites are gaining more and more traction. But in terms of our investment in parasites, they're still lagging pretty far behind 
So this was circulating about two weeks ago. And what it shows is the money that we raise for different diseases or illnesses and the deaths that those diseases or illnesses actually cause. And I thought this was really interesting, but the first thing that I, I asked myself when I saw this is, where's the bloody parasites? There's no parasites on here. And it's true that there's not, because parasites are not a Western issue anymore. For the most part, we've dealt with a lot of them, and those are in large part due to the fact that we have better access to um, latrines and better hygiene um, opportunities in other areas of the world. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of places where parasites are still causing a huge impact are also low-income countries. And we don't invest in these parasites as much because they don't necessarily affect us anymore. And so they've been relegated to a new category called neglected tropical diseases. And that's really what they've become. So if so never mind the money that we actually raise for parasites. If we look at the money that we actually invest in terms of governmental and non-governmental spending in pharmaceuticals and research, parasites actually get about 3% of overall pharmaceutical R&D. The rest is going to more Western diseases. So heart disease, cancer, obesity are some of the few that are getting a bigger piece of the pie. So malaria, which kills about 627,000 people per year, um, is getting about $540,000 per year. Whereas all other neglected tropical diseases are getting about $910,000. But when you consider that all other neglected tropical diseases include leishmania and chagas and all the soil transmitted helmets and polio and malarial worms, each one, is probably making um, about the same amount as a graduate student in our department, which I think we can all agree is not enough. <laughs> so looking at soil transmitted helmets in particular, which are kind of the focus point of my interest in today's talk, um, they kill about 150,000 people a year, but they infect 1.5 billion people. So never mind the population of Canada, never mind the population of the US, these helmets are infecting more people than all people in the Americas put together. So they're clearly of significance, but you're probably thinking to yourself, well, 150,000 people, it's not really that many. <laughs> Maybe we are just investing based on the things that are causing deaths in people. But it's been shown that for a lot of these neglected diseases, just calculating death alone doesn't really do these parasites justice for the mor morbidity and suffering that they're causing. So a new metric was developed by the WHO called DALIES, or Disability Adjusted Life Years. And essentially what DALIES do is they incorporate the mortality that a, a disease causes, but they also incorporate the morbidity that it causes too. So all those years that you might be living with some sort of disability or impairment are also calculated in DALIs. And when you actually look at the DALIs of soil transmitted helmets, they become a greater global burden than malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV put together. So it's really nice that we now have a metric for looking at neglected diseases of humans. But the problem is, we don't have a metric equivalent in animals. So especially wildlife populations, we know that these animals are suffering from all sorts of parasites at any given time. But we don't have any way of knowing what a parasite does until we find the bodies. So at this point, the best estimate we have in many, many wildlife populations is to just look for mortality. And so that's where I started getting really interested in things, was trying to understand what non-lethal parasites are actually doing to wild animals. So to kind of answer this objective, I started my research in Kibale National Park, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. It's a national park in southwestern Uganda, and it's known for having the largest biomass of primates found anywhere on the planet. So it's a really good place to go if you want to study 
primates, which is what I did. Um, so if you look at, um, oh wait, I'm going backwards, that's why. So I actually looked at these guys here. These are red colobus monkeys. And conservatively, we know that red colobus are endangered. But less conservatively, some people are so bold as to say that the only viable populations of that subspecies is within Kimbali National Park. So now I have an endangered animal to look at parasites in. Um, also really important was the fact that one group of red colobus in Kibali National Park has been the focus of really long-term research. So there's one group which has kind of the clinch thing that you need for a wildlife study like this, which is individually recognizable animals. So all these animals are recognizable based on their physical features, but then also colors that um, they've been putting on as part of a larger project for several years. <coughs> so I guess I also need a parasite too, since that's what I'm interested in. And so the one that I chose was this one here. It's called Trichurus, or the common name is whipworm. And it's a gastrointestinal worm um, that only has the one host. So there's no secondary host to worry about. And what happens with these is you ingest eggs from these parasites in contaminated soil or food, and they'll migrate through your intestine, develop into adults, mate, and then the female will release eggs into the feces. So that's really good for me because now I can just scurry around red colobus, kind of like a creek, collect their feces, and have a non-invasive way of determining if the animals are infected or not. Um, we also know that this particular parasite has pathological effects in humans. So especially in people aged 5 to 15, so school-aged children, we know that this parasite um, can do anything from causing just diarrhea, abdominal pain, to physical and developmental stunting. So, um, what I did was I capitalized, oh sorry, before that, um, my objective then more particularly was to look at if these whipworms are <coughs> causing any sort of change in red colobus activity or if there's any sort of behavioral change associated with infection. And so to answer this question, I had some data available to me and that's been collected in the long term, so since 2006. And I used data from 2007 to 2011. And essentially what this data was, was activity data at a glance. So observers would go to this group of red colobus that we knew already, and they would find five individuals and just write down the behavior that each individual was doing at a moment in time. So you get kind of this snapshot look at what an individual is doing. And I paired that with opportunistic eco samples. So when they saw um, a red colobus drop a sample, they would collect that with the individual ID, then I would use that in conjunction. So the favorite part of my PhD was catching up on all the radio lab episodes as I scanned these fecal samples. And um, we identified whether they had trichurus or not, but also how infected they were. So how many eggs per gram we actually found in the fecal sample. So in a bit more detail, I used the fecal sample as kind of the data point, and then I extracted all activity for that fecal sample that occurred within seven days of the collection. And I only included individuals that were both trichurus positive at one point and trichurus negative at another point to be able to control for inter individual um, variation in behavior. So in total, that left me with 43 individuals, 380 fecal samples. All right. So this is all the behavior that a red colobus conducts in an average day. And most of these are pretty data deficient, so they occur less than 1% of the time. And so for those, I remove those, and that leaves us with five different behaviors. So copulate, feed, groom, move, and rest. And for each of these behaviors, what we did was generate generalized mixed effects models um, to look at each behavior in relationship to infection. So as the random effect, we included the individual, um, and then as a fixed effect, we had two. So sex was one, um, because we know there's a difference between males and females in behavior. And then infection status is another. And for infection status, it was just a binary variable. So either yes, they're positive for trichurus, or no, they're negative 
trichuris in the feces. Okay, so this is what the data actually looks like. So these light lines kind of in the background are actually the individuals and they're color coded just to persist with the gender stereotypes. Males are blue and females are pink um, and then the model fit is the thick line. So for feeding, well that's not very good looking. Um, there was essentially no effect whatsoever on feeding. But then if you look at resting, we see a different trend. So males rest more than females. Not so different from our species, I would say. Um, but overall, both increase the amount of time they spent resting when they were trichuris positive. Moving showed a different relationship. So females move more than males, but both decrease the amount of time they spent moving when they were positive for infection. And we saw a very similar trend with grooming. So both decrease the amount of time they spent grooming when they were positive. And then finally, copulating. Males copulated more than females, not surprisingly. Um, but both, again, decreased the time that they spent copulating when they were positive. So you can look at all five of these behaviors together. So this is the relative effect, not the absolute effect. So here we've controlled for um, the fact that some behaviors are more common than others. Um, and it seems like the behavior most affected by infection is copulating. So when it's below the negative or below the zero, it means it decreases with infection. So copulating seems to be most affected, um, followed by grooming and moving. And then the only behavior that significantly increased was resting. So to me, this looks kind of like a trade-off, right? Where individuals, when they're sick, they're resting more and then grooming, moving, and copulating less. So when you look at all five of these behaviors together, it looks something like this. So what this is, is a principal component analysis. And essentially it partitions the variation in your data, and that's partitioned based on the behaviors. And then I've just color-coded the individuals by the infection status they have at that time. And so each individual here is represented twice. Once when they're positive for whipworm, and once when they're negative for whipworm. And it seems like what's happening is when individuals are positive, they cling more towards that resting axis. And when they're negative, they're spending more time moving, grooming, and copulating. So that's kind of my first line of evidence that these parasites may be doing something to the red colobus. To get at my second, I needed to look at behavioral complexity. And so, None of these behaviors seem to be very complex, right? They're not exactly solving world hunger here. Um, but what I mean by behavioral complexity is actual the temporal sequence of behavior that they're doing. So imagine you're watching a red colobus. So they might rest for that amount of time, whatever arbitrary amount of time that is. Then feed for that amount of time, and then groom. Can we predict what they're going to do next? and for how long they're going to do it. And it turns out that's actually really difficult in a lot of animal species because complexity is adaptive. So complexity allows animals to adapt to different environments and different ecosystems. So having a complex set of behaviors is a good thing. But what's been found previously is that complexity actually seems to diminish with stress and also recently it's been found to diminish with parasitism. So a colleague of mine uh, did this work here. He actually resorted to chaos theory to find interesting trends. Thankfully I didn't have to go that far. Um, but what, what's being shown here is one female macaque. And on one day she's sick. And on one day she's healthy. And this is just a sequence of locomotion. So this is when she's sick and this is when she's healthy. So it seems like what's happening is behaviors for sick individuals are becoming more periodic, more easy to predict. And so I wanted to see if this was the case with red colobus. Um, and to do this, I needed to collect a different sample set. So I went back in 2013 to Kibali, and I conducted 30-minute focal follows for 16 individuals that we knew really well. Um, this particular individual is named Lip. She had a weird mouth, which is why her name is Female Lip. Um, 
And essentially what we did with this data was we collected all the activity that the animal was doing in the 30 minutes, and then we averaged the time that they spent performing each behavior for 30 minutes. We got an average amount of time they spent conducting every single behavior. And then we compared between positive and negative using survival analysis. So that's what I'm showing here. So in red are individuals when they're whipworm positive and blue individuals when they're whipworm negative. And these are the same individuals represented twice. Um, and then on the y-axis we have mean switching time. So that's the amount of time they spent doing each behavior in the 30 minute focal. And then on the y-axis we have the switch percentage. So the percentage of individuals that had not switched behavior by that time in seconds. So, for example, at 50%, um, individuals switched behavior by about 63 seconds. But when you look at whipworm positive individuals, it took the same cohort 200 seconds on average to switch behavior, um, for 50% of individuals to switch behavior. So, they're spending a lot more time doing the same thing. And you can look at this within the individual also, and it looks like this. So this is eight females and six males. And when they're negative, you can see that for the most part, they switch behaviors more quickly than when they're positive for whipworm, with two exceptions, which are pretty close together, I think. Um, so that's kind of line of evidence number two. So if... Uh, if you think back to this graph here, and how I said there seems to be activity differences with grooming and moving and resting and copulating, but nothing with feeding. So the thing I thought of was, well maybe it's not the frequency or the proportion of time they're feeding, but what they're feeding on that's changing. So in chimpanzees, um, there's evidence of self-medication. There's actually a really nice body of literature about self-medication in chimps. So chimps will actively seek out vegetation that has what's known to have self-medicative properties. And in particular, they do this one behavior where they'll roll up leaves and then swallow those leaves whole. And they wondered for a really long time why, why they were doing this. And then what some probably poor graduate student found when they were sorting through feces was that these leaves are coming out totally whole. So they're passing through the GI tract almost unchanged. But a lot of times, these leaves also had worms attached to them. So they were helping to expel the worms by some means. And so what they think is happening, actually, is that these leaves are getting swallowed whole so that they can scratch at the intestinal lining of the primate. And when there are worms attached, they'll scratch them off. And the chimps were selecting particular leaves based on the fact that they had these structures on them. They're called trichromes, and essentially they give them this scratchy um, consistency to be able to, to potentially dislodge these worms. So that's a really cool example of what we would have hoped to find, but obviously it's really difficult when your study species is 100 meters above you and eating nothing but leaves. So I started in kind of a different place. Um, being a good student of Jonathan's, I started with a phylogeny. <laughs> so this is a phylogeny of the plant families that a red colobus eats. And in the, in the red are the families that we know have clear characterized medicinal properties. And then in the lighter red or pink are the families that we think may have some sort of medicinal properties, but it's a little bit more suspect. But when I mapped it out like this, the thing that kind of popped out was that it seems like the plants with medicinal um, properties are clustered on the phylogeny. Um, that makes sense. They would probably be subject to evolution like everything else. So what I decided to do was look at how the phylogenetic structure of what red colobus were eating might be changing between whipworm negative and whipworm positive intervals. So this is the same phylogeny that I just showed you, except now it's color-coded by the proportion of time red columbus actually spent eating on that particular plant family. 
So when it's dark blue, they spent very little time eating there. And the lighter it gets, the more time they spent there. And this is when they were whipworm negative. So as you can see, they're already clustering on an area of the phylogeny which we knew had the medicinal properties, and that's when they're whipworm negative. When they're whipworm positive, they're doing pretty much the same thing. So they're still clustering in that same area. And when you look at them together, you can see there's not really any sort of phylogenetic difference in the way that they're feeding, unfortunately. <coughs> Failure number one. Um, but what you might notice is that there's one particular chain that's a little hotter, and that's for a plant family called Fabaceae. So Fabaceae is a really big plant family, and it's also commercially important because it contains the legumes. But it was actually a significant increase in the proportion of time they were eating on this one plant family. <coughs> And in particular, what seemed to be driving that relationship was an increase on feeding on this genus um, called Alvisia. And so they pretty much doubled the, the time that they spent eating on that one genus. And so there's two species of this plant that they eat, Alvisia gummifera and Alvisia grandibrachiata, I think. Um, and the second one has some research done on it on the medicinal properties. So they noticed that chimps were also favoring this plant when they were sick. And so they did some characterizations of what plant secondary compounds it might have. And what they found was that it contains three compounds called saponins. And those had in vitro anti-homanthic activity. Red colobus um, have been studied for whether they like saponins or whether they don't like saponins. So this is a number of um, different phytochemical components in plants that we know the red colobus eat. And it doesn't seem like they really dislike or really like saponins. The only thing that was driving their feeding behavior was the protein to fiber ratio. And so I bring up this last point just to say that um, they might be anti-helminthic in chimpanzees, but red colobus, which have a totally different gut physiology and which already are digesting tons and tons of plant secondary compounds, it's hard to tell. We need to do more stuff. So, the second thing I did with looking at medicinal things was move away from the plant species and just look at the plant parts that red colobus were eating. And shockingly, being called liverous primates, leaf-eating primates, they ate a lot of leaves. Um, and particularly, they liked young leaves quite a lot. The only thing that changed really between negative um, for whipworm and positive to whip for whipworm was bark consumption, and that pretty much doubled. So it went from 3.84 to 7.42 when they were whipworm positive. So that's some stuff that we have for evidence of self-medication. Obviously, it's still a little on the speculative side. What we've really shown is that they tend to increase feeding on a plant that has anti-helminthic properties in other species and on a plant part that has low nutritional value and high fiber. So to conclude, um, it seems like red colobus are increasing resting, decreasing copulating, grooming, and moving. They also seem to be slower to switch behaviors, which suggests that when they're infected with this whipworm, their behavioral complexity is lessened, and there seems to be some evidence of a medicinal change in their foraging strategy. But all this begs the question, why? <laughs> why? Why are they doing this? And with this particular study, there is an observational issue, which is in trying to interpret direction of causality. So the way I've kind of framed it up until now is that these parasites are doing something to the host and causing a change in behavior. But it could be equally true that some sort of behavioral change that's elicited for another reason could be driving a change in infection pattern. And we can't really rule out which one is which. So I'm gonna kind of go with treating them with equal credence and then trying to let the weight of evidence give you my interpretation of what's happening. So let's start with the behavior of the primate is changing parasite infection. So, if we think that the behavior of the primate is changing parasite infection, we would expect the primate to be demonstrating some sort of risky behavior. 
So, for example, some people say that grooming is a risky behavior. Um, why? Because you're sitting next to a conspecific that might have infective stage parasites caught in their fur, and primates like to eat things caught in the conspecific's fur, so potentially that could increase your probability of getting parasites. <coughs> Moving might also be a risky behavior, so you're traveling through your environment, it increases the probability that you'll come into contact with parasites. But if that was true, what we would expect is an increase in grooming and an increase in moving. And that's not what we saw, if you remember, from the first part. Instead, what we saw was an increase in resting. And so that's kind of a better fit for parasites actually causing the behavioral change. And if this is true, we can't really say what's causing the behavioral change. Like, are the parasites exerting some sort of a pathological effect? Like, are they damaging the host and causing them to be weakened, potentially even dying? Or if it's an adaptive strategy on the host's part, they're inducing these behaviors as an adaptive response to infection. So my study definitely can't untangle these two, but it's actually been done previously. And what's been found was in mice, the workhorse of the science world. Um, and what they did was they looked at mouse mothers in laboratory experiments who had recently had litters of pups. So these mouse mothers, um, I'm not sure if you know much about mouse pups, but they're blind and fairly useless and naked. So <laughs> they really rely on the mothers for thermal regulation. Um, and so the mouse mothers will build little nests to keep the pups warm. And so researchers looked at this behavior in relationship to sickness. And essentially what they did was they injected some mouse mothers with saline and then other mouse mothers with LPS. And LPS is um, the active, immunologically active component of endotoxin. So they knew already that that makes animal behave sick. They didn't really know why, but animals started being lethargic, resting more, eating less when injected with this compound. And they looked at the change in